So, Father, we thank you and we ask that you would teach us this morning, God, and remind us as we have illustrations here from the scriptures, God, of just how powerful and important and a blessing the, the faith that we have in you and how we live that out. Teach us tonight, today, God, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Two verse Sunday, just two verses. And everyone said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, the faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Let's go home. No. By the way, thinking about faith, someone put the air on. Praise God, you read this telepathy from the pastor here. He begins with now. Oh, it's going to be a long sermon, huh? No, I bring that up because now is the link between what we studied last week and what we're going on to study this week and for many weeks probably in the future. It's between the two chapters. It's what we were sharing last time. It's what the writer was sharing with his own audience Uh, the writer reminding his readers and standing with them through the persecutions that they were going through and and how they needed to endure with confidence and how that would take faith. As a matter of fact, he quoted Habakkuk. He had the audacity, as we said last week, to quote from Habakkuk. How many of you have heard Habakkuk lately? And uh, one, beautiful. There's always one, you know, he's got to ruin that everything. I'm just kidding. He quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, 4. He does it, of course, in the Greek translation. But the bottom line of this whole verse and that whole section is that the just shall live by what? By faith. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? The just are the righteous. How is one made righteous? The one is made righteous in belief of God. Has nothing to do with us. Has nothing to do with you and me. I look out here and I'm seeing 90, 95% of you are believers. Did you know you're righteous? You're right because of what Jesus Christ has done in your life. You're right because of your belief. You're right because you believe God. And you walk by faith. The just, he says, shall live by faith. Those who believe God and in God. And we're not just talking about New Testament people, of course. We're talking about Old Testament all the way back, all the way from the beginning. Those who trusted God, those who believed God, up to today, you and me. We are to live, guys, because of this faith that we have in God in an unwavering, an unwavering, an unwavering life, an, un, an unwavering faith, because it's in response to to God and what he's done in our life. And it's response to what we read in the word of God. And do we believe in what we read? You know, this is just not just a, a, another textbook, another set of a volume of books that we have in our library. This is, as the writer told us earlier, it's breathing, it's living word of God. And I like to say, listen to it. We approach it that way. It's God's precious word. Lord, what do you have to say to me today? What do you have to say to me this morning? God, I'm going into a meeting. God, I don't know how it's going to end up, but God, I've opened your word. Lord, speak to me. Lord, I'm going through this. I'm going through. God, speak to me this morning. Speak to me tonight, the night. Lord God, this is a rough night. This is a hard thing. It's the word of God. We are to live an unwavering life in response to God's word. And you think about the God that we serve, the Lord that we've received, the the Savior that we embraced, and right there it speaks of our faith. How many of you here today, don't raise your hand, have seen Jesus personally, physically, physically, personally? No one, yet... The world is blown away because we call him Lord. We have a relationship with him. We talk to him. We gather together on a Sunday morning where we can be out golfing. Maybe not today, but 
Or you could be out bowling. You could be at a movie. You could be, you know, sleeping in. But we gather today because of Jesus Christ, because of our Lord, because of our Savior. And yet, they look at us as, how do you know he exists? Ha, why are you guys doing this? Did you know that Jesus said, and I always love to bring this up, when he told Thomas, who, who didn't believe in, at this point that Jesus was walking after the resurrection, that, that, that the other guys had seen him, and, and you know, he wouldn't believe in him, or not believe in him, believe them, that they saw him, and then all of a sudden, Jesus appears. You know that scene in John chapter uh, 20? And this is what he says in 29, and I, I always like to reference this. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's us. We haven't seen them. We haven't. But then we have, in a sense. But then we have had conversations with them. But, and we have had a relationship with them. No, but we haven't seen them physically. We will one day. You see? Believe and you will see. No, I want to see and then I'll believe. God says, no, believe. And that's that step of faith. And that's that step. We, we call it the one-step program. Amen? Amen? Nothing wrong with the 10 steps and all that, you know. But it starts with that one step. And that one step in faith toward Jesus Christ, receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Hence then becomes the relationship. It's not blind faith. They want to say it's blind. No, it's not blind faith. It's not feeling. Feeling. Nothing more than feelings. Now, that's, that's superstition. Uh, that, 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 or as I like to say, stupidstition. That's, that's superstition. Well, I have this feeling, and this aura. When my grandmother died, the priest got in front of the coffin and began to address us. He says, I feel Maria's aura here. I, 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 he began to say, I, feel, I see blue. And we're like, who the heck is this dude, man? Your own institution will throw you off for saying that, at least back then. At least back then. He started getting into this mysticism and this feeling and this superstition. And we're about to be, you know, we're a bunch of Hispanics in there, man. We're about to take homeboy out. It was in East L.A. as a, let alone him doing that thing. But anyway, forgive me, God. Faith is our total response to what God has revealed in his word. It's our total response to what God has revealed in his word. It's a life we lived in a person we love. It's a life we live in a person that we love, anticipating his promises that we will experience, his promises that he gives to us in the word. Some people claim not to have faith. Maybe you're here today, Mark, I don't have enough faith. I just don't. You do. You, you have enough faith. You have enough faith to make, if you want to, sincerely in your heart, if you want to receive Jesus Christ, if you want to have God in your life, you have that, that, that unction or that whatever you want to call it, to take that one step. Just that one step. As we said last week, that's everything the Holy Spirit will do in your life to get you to come to Christ other than to move that foot to make that decision for you. You've got to do that. That's why it's a personal relationship. So people say they don't have it. Well, you exercise this faith that we talk about. Maybe, maybe it's just this, this human instinct of faith at this point. Every time you drink water out of a faucet, you don't know what's in those pipes. Can you imagine what's living in those pipes? But yet, I see you here, even here, you push that button and water comes out. And <laughs> By the way, don't make faces when you do that. I'm just kidding. You're at a restaurant, and they, I'll just take water. You don't know where that water came from? I remember when we were little, I was sharing with somebody here a couple weeks ago. My sister would have to clean the house, okay? So my parents worked on the weekend, on Saturday. They'd go to work, and my sister, you would have to clean. So she t- kicked me and my brother out and lock us out and, you know, so she could clean the house. And that let us in maybe, maybe five minutes before our parents would come home. But we'd be out there like this in the windows, you know. Uh, we're thirsty, we're thirsty. We'll drink out of the hose. Isn't that some great water? Out of you don't know what's in that. But I, yeah. That, that rubbery taste, it was just good, man. 
That's why I am the way I am. I'm jacked up, man. You go to the drugstore and you get a prescription, right? And you read the prescription and whatever it says you do, take this every two hours or whatever, and you're taking it. I mean, that's, that's just you're, you're exercising some kind of faith there. Your faith in the medicine and your faith in the, in the doctor the, who prescribed it for you. You get on the freeway and you drive the speed limit right, wrong, with a, with a, a lamp sticker on your car. And you're trying to be a witness, but it's just you're late, okay? You go to a dentist, and they're drawing around your teeth, and you, you don't even know if he's doing the right tooth or not, man. You sort of, Ugh. no, I'm being silly, but we all have some kind of faith. And when the Holy Spirit begins to convict you and tug your heart and says, you need Jesus, you have the ability, the awesome ability to cross over that threshold of, in faith. You say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and if you want me, here I am, God. And your word says, and I take it by faith, that you'll forgive me of every filthy thing I've ever done in my life. Where are you going to get that from, man? You're not going to get that from anyone other than God, other than his son, Jesus Christ. So you have. It's there. You can do it. It's just the fact is that you truly want forgiveness. But living by faith gives to us a solid foundation of hope to endure even through trials and tribulations. I'm reminded of Paul's faithful life. Again, I have to give illustrations to talk about this. You're going to see that throughout this study. And I'm reminded of Paul's faithful life when in Acts chapter 23, and how he was going through a, a, some, some great actual trials, and he was being rejected by his own people, you know, he got to a point where there was almost a riot breaking out. And some of the, uh, you know, the, the leaders there saw that and were going to rescue Paul from really being killed. And I'm sure that was going on in Paul's head because it goes on in our head too as we're trying to do the right things and people are against us and what's going on and am I doing the right thing? And, and it was that night where Jesus himself came to him in Acts 23, 11. First of all, he said, be of good cheer. Why would he have to say that? Because probably Paul was a little bummed out. Paul was depressed. You know, what is going on here? He says, Paul, be of good cheer, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now think, just look at that. What's that? You're going to Rome, Paul. I'm not done with you here. The worry that you have at this point, the, the crowds outside, your, you know, the complex there that you're at, the, the words that you hear, even a few stones that you're, you're ducky, don't worry about that. I didn't bring you all the way here to drop, to, to, to leave you alone. To, you're going to Rome. Now, he didn't know how he was going. Jesus never gave him any details on this future trip to Rome. But Paul walked by faith. He walked by faith and not by the events. He walked by faith in God's word. He walked by faith in Jesus' words. And the things that went against him, he didn't let those things keep him from believing in what Christ said. You're going to bear witness to me in Rome. Think about that. By the time we get to Acts 27, we find Paul on his way to Rome. Hallelujah! But it's not the way he thought he probably would go. Right? I'll take a nice, uh, you know, cruise on a nice boat, you know. No, he went as a prisoner. He went as a prisoner. He was placed on a ship heading into a storm. And as things be began to develop and we know the the book of Acts, we know the story. There was a tempest. There was a time. It was a season when storms would come. He tried to talk to people out of it. Hey, listen, look at, don't go, man. This is the wrong season. We'll, we just hold off here until, you know, this season's over, and then we can move on. And, of course, they were not listening to him. Maybe Paul was a little anxious, realizing, you know, 
Well, maybe, you know, was, was God's word, is it going to come to pass? You know, this is not the right time to sail. But no, he, he battled through that. They went on, and little did he know, or maybe he did know, but he gave him an opportunity to just stand and address this fearing naval crew who were the experienced sailors who got themselves in a storm, who, who, who didn't listen to Paul, and, and now they're in the midst of the storm. God bless you. And one more time. And in Acts 27, it says, And now I urge you to take heart that there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. How could Paul say that? Because he knows he's going to Rome. And as long as he's on that ship, there ain't going to be no loss of life. I mean, that's just faith spoken. For there stood by me this night an angel of God. I love this because God sent this angel, this messenger, to remind Paul of the words of Jesus. <laughs> and he says, to whom I belong and whom I serve, the God, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So we're all going to hang in there, guys. You didn't listen to me at first, but we're all going to make it. We might not look like much, but we're going to make it. And he said, therefore, take heart, man, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told to me. That's faith. That's faith in God's word. It's faith in what God has said. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, wait a minute. I was with you with the God thing, man. What do you mean? Yeah, we're going to crash. That's the consequence. That's, that's for, for, for our failure and, and not holding back and not staying back. But we're going to be okay. And crash they did, but not a soul died who stayed in the ship. And eventually we know Paul arrived in Rome. Paul had faith in the Lord's word and reminded by the angel of God, you're going to Rome. Come storm, come high, high water, even wreckage. And a viper bite. Remember that? He just shook it off. How can someone just shake off a poisonous viper's bite? Because he knew, I'm going to Rome. I'm not staying here. I'm not staying in these seashores. He just shakes it off. Everybody's freaking out. Oh, my God. Who is this dude? He would step foot in Rome, and he would stand before Caesar. That's faith. What promises have God given you this week? What are you reading in the script? I hope you read the scriptures with anticipation of the Holy God speaking to us. The Holy Spirit speaking to us. Paul would write in Romans 5, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith, amen, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Well, wait a minute. See, Paul knew what tribulations were. And, and, and knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. This is, this is the lessons he learned in trials. And then persever, perseverance, character. And character, there's our word hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I mean, it's just such a great set of words here put there by Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's true. It's true that hope does not disappoint. And so the author in this chapter is attempting to provoke, if I can say, stir up, as he said last week, last time, stir up, the am- embers of, of faith, stir up the, the embers of, of belief that are growing cold in the hearts of these Hebrew Christians to a life of faith. And that faith in Christ. And he'll do so using their own brethren, their own heroes of the faith, and, and, and bringing them into the, the holy ground of the hall of faith, as we would call it, and talking about men and women that they've read about, that has been read to them through the scrolls, and how, how, how great their faith was as they continued on. 
in, in anticipation of the coming Messiah. And he's almost saying this, and guess what? You're living in the day that the Messiah has come already. You're living on this side of the cross. You guys are, are blessed. You're living in a, a period of grace now. You're, you're not anticipating. You're not looking, looking back. Uh, you're not looking forward to the cross. You're looking back to it. The times of grace. And basically he's saying, you guys are so blessed, you don't even realize it. These guys looked forward to the cross, looked forward to a Messiah to come. Well, he's come, and now you're living in the days and the blessings of that. So before we visit the Hall of Faith, and it's not in Ohio, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, uh, the Football Hall of Fame is, but this one's in the Bible. Before we go visit that, let's just do our best to define faith, okay? So again, back to verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Wiersbe said something interesting as I was studying. He says, this is not a definition of faith, but a description. And that's what I said in the beginning. How can you really give a definition of faith without a description of it? In other words, faith has to be described in order for it to be defined. And in order for faith to be described, it has to be lived out. That's the only, th- only way we can really share. It's personal. It's a personal relationship. And let me tell you, your friends, they love to hear stories. They love to hear the stories. How God intervened. How, how, how God moved in your life. Huh? And that's your faith. And, and, and how, how, what you believe in. And why you believe in. They, they love to hear personal stories. He says that, uh, and he writes of the experiences and the great examples of this faith and in hope of an anticipation of their Messiah. The word faith means simply trust and belief. Trust and belief. It speaks of a firm ground. It speaks of a solid foundation. And in context, of course, our firm ground and our solid foundation is Jesus. Jesus Christ is of whom we believe in, of whom we stand on, of whom we trust, of whom we believe in. He is the object of our faith. He is the one that we live for. He is the one who saved us. He's the one we took one step program toward. He's the one we trust. He's the one we believe. And faith and trust and belief is a course in God in spite of consequences. It will always be there. We stand firm. We stand solid in our faith in Christ. When I was writing this up, I was thinking of Daniel chapter three of those three Hebrew young adults. How many of you go into our young adult, you know, our young adult uh, meetings, you know? These were three young adults, maybe even young teenagers or old teenagers. Young adults like to be called old teenagers only for a little bit. Shadrach, Meshach and a Chicano and uh, Abednego. Now, we know the story, right? They needed to bow down to a statue that was uh, formed after Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, at this point was just all full of himself and he had this statue made and out of a dream and so on. You guys know the story. If not, read the whole book of Daniel this weekend. This week, it's a wonderful book. But they wouldn't do it. And Nebuchadnezzar, he liked these guys. You know, he, he, he liked them. He uh, liked Daniel. And, you know, these guys really, you know, were some good guys, smart. But uh, he heard that they would not bow down. And verse 15, it picks it up. He says, now, now if you're, you are ready at, at the time, um, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. We're going to give you a second chance. (laughs) 
But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Well, you're going to find out, Nip. You're going to find out real quick. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I love these guys. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And here it is, verse 18. But if not, our faith will not fail us. We believe that God can deliver us from a fiery furnace as he will deliver you. What are you going through today? Are you going through a fiery trial? He'll deliver you through that. And if not, if you take your last breath, you'll be with him in paradise, in heaven. But if not, and I love this, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Hey, Neb, we have a win-win here. Our faith is strong, man. We believe God could intervene. God could even come into that fiery furnace to save us from that. But if not, we know we'll be with God anyway. It wasn't his will. I love that faith. I love that in the midst of a trial. Look, at faith is not a leap into darkness, though. But a step into the light. A step into the light, given assured hope. Understand that. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance is, 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 is a Greek word. Uh, it's made up of two words, means to stand under. That gives us assurance. It gives us confident assurance. He says, the substance of things hoped for, uh, a joyful expectation to trust in. But if not, King Nebuchadnezzar, we still have hope. We still have a joyful expectation. We still know that we are gods and he will watch over us however he will deliver us. This gives us a joyful expectation, expectation to trust in. Our faith in Jesus gives to us the hope of eternal life. That's what we live for. That's what we stand on. Gives us hope. Ed Taylor says, hope is what keeps our soul anchored to the truths of heaven when suffering is weighing us down. He was a man who lost his son at a very young age, just married, just had a child. He was a man who went through a trial, him and his wife, and he's able to write that because he has that experience. How do you define faith? How do you find hope? You have to define it through experience. You have to define it through illustrations. If you haven't experienced that, well, I can look at the three young Hebrew boys. I can look at Daniel thrown into the lion's case. I can look at Isaiah. I can look at these heroes who suffered and many died, but they died with hope. And that's great faith. I love that. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence means the conviction or the proof. The conviction or the proof of things not seen. Faith faith is the conviction of things not seen, as if one had seen them. But if not, we know we'll be delivered. If not... We believe God will watch over us. Not seen. Conviction of things not seen as if one had seen them. I I think of, and I'm going to kind of creep ahead into the hall of of, of faith. I got a key, and I was reading of Noah. And you think of Noah. Noah exercised this kind of faith. Think about it. And we'll get to it. We'll go more in depth in these guys' life. But he was divinely warned of things not yet seen. I mean, think about it. We know Noah is a great story. 
Sunday school story for kids. They love it. But we as adults, we have to understand that the words rain and flood are used for the first time in the Bible in Genesis. They were either unknown or undefined. And God is speaking of this to this man. He's chosen this man, Noah, out of all the people in the world. And he gives them a divine warning of things not yet seen. And it says he was moved with godly fear. He was, he was moved with his faith in God and God's word in honor of God. And he prepared what God told him to prepare. And that was an ark for a coming flood. How do you explain that to people when they see you start to build this thing and start to gather the materials? And they're asking, what are you doing, Noah? What you, you know, well, God said to do this, that there's a, a flood coming. There's rain is going to come. People are going to die. And it's hard for me to explain it, but just you got to trust God at his word. We know no one else did, right, other than his, his kids and his daughter-in-law's. They were unknown or undefined at that time. J. Uh, Oswald Sanders says, faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. And you read that, it says, God, that's what kind of faith I want, Lord, help me. That's the kind of faith I want. He goes on to talk about the witness of faith. Verse two, and we'll close he says, for by it, by what? By faith defined and described, by faith illustrated, by faith and given application, whether it's application of one's own personal experience or application of, of what we read in the word of God. He says, by, for by it, by faith, the elders, he's not talking about church elders here. He's talking about their ancestors Again, he wants to point his first audience, the recipients of the letter, to their ancestors. He wants wants to to show them that that by faith, these Old Testament saints, whom are listed in verses 4 through 40 of this chapter, obtained a good testimony, obtained a great testimony, a great testimony of faith. They were a good witness. Their faith was lived out. Their faith is reliable in God. Their faith was true. So much so that they're known as a great cloud of witnesses. A great cloud of witnesses. Left for us to read, left for us to study and to see, wow, the things that they went through. Well, they're no different than us. They put our sandals on like we do. They... They, 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 sure, they, they lived in the ancient times. And, but if we're living in more modern times, how could we not live by faith? There's so many distractions, aren't there? There's so many things that would keep us from having faith. We have bank accounts and money and we have MasterCard and, and things like that that will get us through. But let me tell you, friend, as you're running and running and running, eventually those, even those things will run out. And we call it in the Christendom, you come to the end of yourself, whatever it is. And it's at that time where hopefully you'll take that one step toward God. We're left with a great testimony of these elders, a baton of faith passed on to us, passed on to them to continue on. The race isn't over. The battle isn't done. It's won. We've, we're, we're victors but we've got to go through it. There's got to be lessons learned. There's got to be, there's got to be you know, faith stories written and, and glory to God for all that we live through. Paul will tell us we walk by faith and not by sight. As I said before, one day we're going to walk by sight. We have family members who are walking by sight right now. They have gone before us. We are on our way as pilgrims. We're journeying, journeying through until we come before the Lord. Amen. Read ahead, guys. It's going to get exciting. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get through chapter 11, but I want to look at, I say that right now, but I, 
as the Lord leads, I want to look at every one of these lives. So we'll be in the Old Testament a lot. And we'll be le- learning a lot about Abraham and Moses and all the greats. You know, and interesting people that are found in this hall of fa- faith that you might have thought, whoa, hold up, wait a minute. They're in that? Yeah, just like I'm in it. <laughs> just like my name is written on the scrolls of heaven. And your name is written on the scrolls. But is your name written? Have you received Christ as your savior? Have you taken that one step program? You have enough faith to do that, but it's got to come from the heart. It's a serious thing. It's, it's a matter of, of death and then life, you see. Because everyone is going to die. But after death, what will take place? I have the assurance and the hope and the faith to know that I have eternal life because I took that one step program 40 years ago. Imagine. But you could start today. So, Father, we thank you, God. And if there will be anyone here today, God, who is ready to take that one step, I just pray for them right now. That that's where it begins. Our faith life, our experience. Uh, begins with that one step. If you're here today, all you have to do is cry out to Jesus Christ. To cry out to him and believe what he did for you on that cross. That he came to die. To die for your sins. And at death, if that wasn't enough, payment paid in full. The receipt came at the resurrection three days later. The receipt, payment in full. He died for our sins. And that death is still as active today and and valuable and available today for anyone who would call upon his name. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. I receive you as Lord and Savior. Just right in your chair, you can just talk to him. And he will hear that prayer of faith.